let's see, and it's recording, excellent. Good morning. Um, well, when I say everyone, I mean both of you, I guess. Um, uh, welcome to uh, lecture number three. Um, we're gonna have a little fun today. Um, I told you last time that um, uh, I wanted you to think about uh, how much intellectual, how many examples of intellectual property uh, are represented by um, the, um, the Apple bag that I, uh, that I showed you. But before I get into that, I, I want to talk a little bit about something that Professor Eager raised in his lecture yesterday, because I think it's just, um, it's perfect. It's a perfect intro to one of the things I wanted to go over in this course. We'll take it a little bit out of order, uh, but I think it um, will serve to illustrate some really important principles of uh, intellectual property that directly affect each and every one of you. And so um, what better way to make a subject matter resonate than by giving you an example of something that literally applies to you as you sit here today, uh, listening um, uh, to this, uh, uh, this conference, this, this lecture. And uh, it has to do with the article that um, uh, Professor Eager showed everyone yesterday from the MIT um, News. Um, have, um, uh, do you remember the article that, um, uh, uh, that we, um, uh, that, that, that I mentioned, that, that, that Professor Eager talked about yesterday concerning the, um, the uh, polymer um, uh, conductive polymers and how they were going to how they're able to transform uh, essentially the um, uh, the world of electronics um, and um, uh, if I can find my lecture um, so by, by the way did anybody bother to uh, go out and um, and uh, read that article. Yes, no? Um, I don't know um, uh, if, um, if any of you have access to the MIT News or if it's published on the website, but as you recall, talk, Professor Eager talked about this invention so that claim to be able to transfer data 10 times faster than a USB port, and it was gonna transform the uh, electronics industry. And the point of, I think, um, uh, that Professor Eager was trying to make is that, you know, uh, as uh, scientists uh, and as consumers of uh, information, you have to question everything. Um, but let's, um, let's give the authors of this, uh, uh, article, the benefit of the doubt, and let's say that they've uh, stumbled upon a transformative um, technology um, for just for the purposes of our discussion today. Uh, who is it? Uh, can everybody see the um, uh, see my share, uh, my screen share, my question? Yes, no? Yes, I can say it. I, I can't I can't tell if it's up there. So thanks. So the, so the question I wanted to start the course with is who owns the right to this data transfer system that is going to transform the uh, uh, the entire electronics industry? Can you tell me? Anybody? Anybody hazard a guess? Anybody? Uh, anyone want to speculate? If you if you read the article uh, on page six, you'll see uh, this. Uh, at the bottom of page six, it states, this research was funded in part by Intel, Raytheon, the, the uh, Naval Research Laboratory and the Office of Naval Research. Um, that um, uh, I think is the best introduction to um, what I wanted to talk about because it implicates two things uh, that are exceptions to the guiding principle that I told you at the beginning of this course we needed to always keep in mind, especially when we're talking about um, your rights as inventors. Uh, uh, and, and that guiding principle is for purposes of, um, of uh, uh, recalling it is 
that since 1790, patent law has always operated on the premise that rights to an invention belong to the inventor. And that's that famous case, Board of Trustees of Leyland Stanford Junior University um, versus Roach, uh, which is you know, the, giant, um, the giant pharmaceutical company. Uh, and actually its predecessor, uh, I think it's, it was called Seda or some, uh, something like that. Um, but that operating premise um, uh, has um, uh, its origins, as I think I've mentioned already in Article I, Section 8, Clause 8 of the United States Constitution. So when we talk about intellectual property rights, we're literally going back to the founding principles uh, of our country as um, uh, they were um, uh, formalized by the uh, drafters of the Constitution, Thomas Edison, Benjamin Franklin, uh, James Madison, all first and foremost um, entrepreneurs uh, and many of them inventors. Um, they understood the value, the commercial value of intellectual property rights and they found it so important that they actually put it into Article I of the Constitution. And, and by the way, Article I of the Constitution, the, the first article of the Constitution comes before the um, articles that describe the courts uh, or the executive branch. So it gives you an idea of the hierarchy in the founders' minds that intellectual property uh, rights occupy. And so Article I, Clause 8, Section 8 states that Congress has the power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. Um, there it is in black and white in the Constitution, and that's where, where the United States Supreme Court went in order to um, reaffirm the uh, basic operating principle that inventors are the ones that own the rights to their inventions. All right, um, so that brings us to the exceptions to the rule. Um, the first exception, which goes back to the original uh, uh, clause in the Constitution granting power, Congress this power, is that inventors own the rights to their discoveries and their inventions unless Congress, for very good reason, says they don't. So that's the first exception to this operating principle. And that exception uh, to the uh, operating principle affects each and every one of you as students at MIT. And I want to talk about that a little bit today. But I want that brings me to the second exception, and that is where the parties may themselves alter the operating principle by agreement. And that second exception to this operating principle affects each and every one of you as students at MIT. And, I, and it even affects um, uh, prestigious members of the faculty here uh, who will remain unnamed. But I think he mentioned in one, one of his lectures last week that he was asked to sign a certain agreement. Well, that's an example of how the exceptions to this basic operating principle uh, can affect even the lives of faculty here at MIT. So you have under the constitution, a, a presumption uh, that you own the, the results of your, um, your creativity and, and inventiveness, unless one of these two operating exceptions comes into play. So let's talk about these exceptions a little bit because they all are talked about in the uh, Leyland um, uh, Stanford case that, um, that I mentioned, uh, which by the way, uh, Justice Roberts was the, um, was the um, author of that opinion. Okay, so this literally comes, this, this, this is a quote from the Stanford case. Um, Justice Roberts, you know, talks about the history of um, intellectual property rights. He talks about the constitution he talks about Article I, Section 8, Clause 8. He talks about how um, uh, uh, Congress has granted uh, these uh, powers 
uh, but and may only change the constitutional operating principle for very good reason, and how the courts will always bend over backwards to enforce the operating premise that uh, the inventor owns their invention. But then there's this next paragraph uh, in um, uh, Justice Roberts' uh, opinion. And it says, absent an agreement to the contrary, an employer does not have rights in an invention which is original, which is the original conception of the employee alone. An inventor must expressly grant those rights to his employer. So there is the second exception to the operating premise and the one that, if, that affects each and every one of you um, because this is the exception that universities have seized on in the aftermath of um, uh, Leyland, uh, Stan the Leyland um, uh, Stanford case uh, to um, change uh, basically the constitution. And how they do it, they get you to agree to change the constitution yourself. This is the, this is the parachute, this is the opt-out clause. I think somebody mentioned uh, on our first lecture, um, the, um, um, the loopholes uh, in the law. Well, here's the loophole that the Supreme Court left to universities and um, other uh, uh, institutions that deal um, with um, basic research. Uh, and can anybody guess what colleges and universities have done with this, this loophole? Um, well, the answer is they've, they've, they've absolutely driven a truck through it, okay? And this is what affects each and every one of you. Yeah. So uh, in most cases, a patent may be issued only to the apply in, applying inventor uh, or because the inventor's interest in the invention has been assigned by her um, in a, by, via an instrument of writing to the assignee. So the op this is, again, a manifestation of the operating principle. Uh, the patent or the intellectual property in, uh, belongs to the inventor or to whomever the inventor designates. And of course, that's somebody usually with a bunch of money to give to the inventor. So this uh, is the, the, again, the backstop that uh, the Stanford case was, uh, uh, was reiterating. Um, but then along comes Congress and they, um, uh, they pass a law called the Dole Act. Its, its true name is the University and Small Business Patent Procedures Act of 1980. <clears throat> and this act allocates rights in all federally funded uh, inventions between the federal government and federal contractors. And um, who are federal contractors? Well, uh, there's places like Raytheon, uh, Intel, Boeing, but there's also places like Stanford University, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Harvard University, all of whom have one thing in common. They receive government money in order to conduct basic research. And so Congress came along and said, look, if the taxpayers are gonna pay for this research, they should have the benefit of their investment. Therefore, we are exercising our power under Article One, Section Eight, Clause Eight of the Constitution to allocate the rights to intellectual property to the taxpayers, since for, for, for the way we view it, they paid for the invention themselves. So this Ba-Dole Act is, um, is uh, a, a, the most significant piece of legislation passed by the Congress other than the laws that they passed describing intellectual property rights, patents, trademarks, and copyrights. We, we went over them. Title 15, Title 17, Title 35. Other than those, those laws which describe intellectual property rights for everyone in this country, the Ba Dole Act, named after Senators Ba and Dole, um, is the most significant act to come along uh, from the United States Congress, I would argue, in the history of um, congressional acts involving intellectual property. And it affects each and every one of, one of you. In fact, it was the Ba Dole Act that was at the heart of the controversy 
that um, resulted in the Stanford, the Leyland Stanford case that, um, that we've been talking about. The one case that I'd like you to remember, if you remember any cases at all uh, uh, in this course or, or in your lifetime, you only have to really know one, one, one case to understand the, the law of intellectual property, and that's the Stanford Leyland College case. So, um, this Baudol Act, as I said, revolutionized the way that universities look at technology uh, and inventions by allowing research institutions under the act to elect to retain title to inventions generated uh, through federal funding, okay? So let me give you an example. You're, you're working in a laboratory at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology or at Raytheon or at um, uh, Daper Laboratories. Um, and um, you come up with an invention uh, based upon uh, research that you did that was funded through MIT or one of the other private um, companies I've mentioned. Um, uh, uh, that funded your, uh, the, the research that you did that led to your discovery. In, in that case, the presumption still remains that you are the owner of the invention. It's only if the institution uh, that you're working at elects to opt in and um, uh, uh, ex exert ownership rights uh, to the invention. And they have a certain amount of time that they have to do this in, and there are formalities that they have to follow. And if they don't follow those formalities, or if they don't act within the time prescribed under the act, then guess who owns the invention? Can anybody guess? The answer is you own the invention. We go back to the operating principle. So uh, under the Leyland College case, the Stanford case, um, the court was dealing with this Baudol Act, and they said Congress is allowed to carve out exceptions to this act, but they must be limited, and there, there must be formalities that Congress has to follow and that contractors have to follow, and if they don't, we go back to the operating principle. So if, for instance, uh, you were working at, a, uh, at, at one of the laboratories on an invention which um, you believed you should have the rights to, and the uh, contractor came along and uh, decided to assert rights to the invention, and you came to my office uh, and you looked for advice, the first thing we look at is whether or not, uh, first of all, this invention was subject to the Baudol Act. You know, was it something that was developed uh, with substantial assistance from the United States government? And if it was, did the contractor follow the formalities that they're required to follow? Uh, did they act within the period of time they're required to act? If not, the invention is yours. But can you imagine uh, what... Um, uh, what uh, this particular act does for contractors and universities uh, and research institutions, of course. Um, what this has done is, it, is it's uh, given them the ability to uh, become very rich because it is rare that an institution will not assert uh, or elect to retain title to an invention. Uh, it, it does happen sometimes, but in most cases when something has a commercial value, um, uh, the institution will, um, uh, will assert uh, to retain title to it. And, and that is why the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Harvard and Boeing and Raytheon and Lincoln Laboratories all have offices within them full of patent lawyers. Um, it's because uh, these are tremendously valuable uh, to these institutions. And their job is to assert rights to commercially viable inventions, which they have a right to assert. But the problem is, as, as the story I told you uh, last class uh, illustrates, is sometimes they overstep. Sometimes they try to assert ownership rights to things that they don't own. And that's because there's a tremendous commercial advantage. There's a lot of money to be made uh, oftentimes uh, 
uh, asserting ownership rights to the things that each of you um, uh, has the potential to create. So most major universities hold, uh, well, the, the, I, don't, I don't remember where I got this. I certainly wasn't talking about um, a particular uh, famous technical uh, uh, institution in Cambridge. Um, uh, I guess if you take all the colleges in the country and average it out, you might say that they have hundreds of patents, but MIT owns or has an interest in thousands and thousands of patents. Um, and so does Harvard, and so does Yale, and so does Caltech, and so does Stanford, and almost every university that uh, conducts basic research, their, their endowment, their lifeblood, the way they pay faculty, the way they build beautiful buildings is in large part funded on the um, way that they can commercially exploit um, uh, inventions uh, funded uh, through the government or um, uh, other uh, or, or through uh, by themselves. So um, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, the Stanford case because we didn't really talk about it, you know, in detail. In cases are easy to remember, and I think are kind of fun when you when you actually look at the facts behind them. The the Stanford case actually involved research being done uh, on a um, uh, a test to detect um, the HIV virus. And it was being done by uh, this fellow, Mark uh, Holodny, uh, who uh, had a contractual duty to assign his inventions uh, to Stanford, where he was doing the research, okay? But instead of assigning it to Stanford, uh, he assigned it to somebody else. He, he, assigned, he assigned it to Roach, actually assigned it to Roach's predecessor, but um, for simplicity's sake, um, uh, we'll say that uh, he assigned it to Roach, the giant pharmaceutical uh, company. And when Stanford found this out, they went and sued Roach um, and um, uh, accused them of uh, patent infringement. Now, now, why didn't they sue um, uh, their researcher? Can anybody guess why they didn't sue their researcher? Have you ever heard of the term deep pockets? Who, who has deep, deeper pockets? A multi-billion dollar uh, biotech company or a, uh, uh, somebody working on their doctoral thesis uh, in some obscure lab deep in the bowels of a research university? And I think the, the, the choice is, is pretty, pretty obvious. So they went out and they sued Roach Brothers um, and, and they said, hey, um, Roach Brothers, you're infringing on the rights that we own to this technology because the Ba Dole Act um, automatically vests the rights to an invention in the funding university. That was how they were reading the Ba Dole Act. Um, but the Supreme Court uh, said no. Uh, and they, um, uh, what they, they, they said that uh, Stanford's argument uh, goes against, as we discussed, the tradition of patent law uh, and, and really wasn't in accordance with the statute because Stanford never followed the formalities under the statute which had um, uh, been laid out by the Congress. And, and you can't really blame Stanford too much because for the longest times, universities across the country had a standard way of doing business. Um, and it wasn't to follow the formalities in the Ba'adol Act. And through intimidation and through coercion and through just um, uh, a, a accepted method of doing business, people handed over the rights to their technology left and right because um, Stanford said so. Uh, they would come to people and say things like, well, you should turn it over to us just out of loyalty to the, uh, to the institution. Turn, out, turn over your invention worth millions to us. And people did. Well, it wasn't until someone with the uh, means to stand up to Stanford, um, because Mark uh, Holodny, I mean, 
really how much uh, how, how how many hours uh, of a lawyer that charges seven hundred dollars an hour uh, can he afford uh, to take Stanford on? But Roach saw the commercial value in this uh, invention, and Roach fought back. And Roach looked at the statute and said, not only does your invention not uh, comply with the um, requirements under the statute, we don't even think um, uh, it uh, was intended by Congress to, um, uh, to uh, uh, um, be included under the Baal Act. And it had to do with the circumstances under which the invention was um, created. Remember, we talked about a student who uh, did a lot of research on her own and invented a little uh, machine and uh, was able to exploit that patent herself uh, and a famous uh, technolo technological institution in Cambridge tried to take those rights away and we were able to show that, um, uh, that the invention didn't fall under the Bad Dole Act because the student had come up with the idea on their own. Um, and it was because of the decision in the Stanford case that the student was able to keep that invention. Because up until then, even um, uh, institutions, and I'm talking about, when I say up until then, up until 2017, even institutions like um, uh, MIT uh, hadn't really read the Stanford decision and had continued to do business the way they had done business for decades, and that is, you know, hey, it's just accepted that you're going to turn this over to us. Uh, nobody reads the Constitution. Nobody read the Baal Act. Just do what we uh, tell you to do. So the Stanford decision was a major wake-up call um, for uh, not only Stanford but for every technical university across Hold the United on. States. I'm the I'm the sorry. Oh, sorry. I'm the <laughs> sorry. Sorry. I, I thought that was a question. <laughs> no, I got to figure out how to turn this off. All right. So, so, so let me let me go through a couple of the things about the Baal Act that you kind of need to know, just sort of general, and then we'll go back to the Stanford decision and 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 what has happened since then that affects each and every one of you. So the Act basically creates a three-tier system for uh, patent rights. Uh, applicable to federally funded research. So the key there is that the research has to be federally funded, okay? Um, and in your particular case, uh, as applies to nonprofit organizations such as universities and small businesses, um, the, the three tiers are, are, um, are as follows. And, and think of this as the order of priority in terms of ownership under the Ba Dole Act, assuming the invention uh, comes within the provisions of the Act. So they are as follows. The, the, the person, uh, the entity that has the first right is the, is the funded firm, okay? So if Raytheon is receiving money from the Naval Research Institute, um, Raytheon would be uh, the, the presumed owner uh, if the Baal Act applied. Uh, failing that, if, if, for instance, Raytheon doesn't assert its rights or if Raytheon doesn't want the rights, then the United States government has what are called marching in rights, all right? So uh, again, um, from the date of the invention, um, the United States government has a certain period of time to raise its hands and say, oh, you know, we'd like to assert the ownership rights to this invention um, and as long as the government has complied with the formalities under the act, um, it is the second uh, order, of owner of order of ownership under the Baal Act. If they don't assert it within the prescribed time, if they don't follow um, the, um, uh, the formalities, then the employee who made the invention uh, will retain uh, or obtain the resulting patent rights. So you can see that no matter what, we keep going home to the operating principle. So if the funding firm doesn't want it or doesn't comply with the statute, then the next is the government. If they don't want it or don't comply with the statute, then the, um, the default position goes back to Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 of the United States Constitution. And it's the, it's the owner of the invention uh, that uh, owns the intellectual property rights to it. That means you. Um, and, and under the act, pursuant to uh, uh, the, the act, 
um, if you come up with something, um, a, um, an aluminum, um, a, a machine that, in, that, that creates aluminum uh, fuel out of, um, uh, out of thin air, uh, then what you must do is disclose the subject invention uh, to the federal agency. So if it's the Office of Naval Research that's funding it, and you've invented this uh, aluminum fuel machine, you go to your professor and you say, I've invented an aluminum fuel machine. I think um, uh, uh, it was funded by the, um, uh, by the institution or the Office of Naval Research. We need to notify them. And then the, the, your, your professor will uh, go to the patent office or the intellectual property office of the university. They'll notify the Office of Naval Research or whoever funded it and say, hey, uh, you have um, uh, you know, certain rights here. Do you want to exercise them? Meanwhile, they will be uh, deciding whether or not they want to uh, exercise uh, their rights. But it all uh, starts under the act with the obligation of the inventor who's receiving federal funds um, to um, notify the federal agency, either directly uh, or through the institution where they are employed. And then what happens, uh, well, and oh, and by the way, uh, what, what, what qualifies as a subject invention, and this is really important, because this is where the loophole is. A subject invention is any invention of the contractor conceived or first actually reduced to practice in the performance of work under a funding agreement, and provides that contractors may elect to retain title to any such invention. So what does that mean? conceived or, actu or first actually reduced to practice. Does that mean an idea? If you have an idea when you're working for Raytheon uh, for an aluminum uh, uh, creation machine, uh, does that qualify for uh, under the Bayer-Dole Act? And I see some head shaking, no, of course not because it has not been expressed in tangible form. Another way of talking about ex expression of an invention in tangible form is reduced to practice. Those are fancy legal words for you, you actually have expressed it in tangible form. You've demonstrated it, for instance, uh, in, the, in, the in the example of a aluminum generating machine. The, the photo I showed you the other day of the student who recreated the experiment using a flask and uh, a way of measuring the amount of gas given off by the aluminum BBs is an example of reducing an invention to practice. So to qualify under the Bayer-Dole Act, you have to have reduced to practice uh, 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 the invention while you were working for the contractor. If you have the idea uh, and then reduce it to practice after you, le you leave the employment, does Baudol uh, apply? I, I think most certainly it does not because it needs to be reduced to practice while you were uh, uh, employed by the funding agency, okay? But if it is reduced to practice uh, by the funding uh, while you're working for the funding agency, then both the uh, funding agency and the contractor you're working on have uh, rights to the act, uh, to, to the invention. And by Let the me way, just, can I interject that many please. companies interpret that they own the rights to your ideas for the rest of your life. And that's wrong, that, that that's the position they will take. That, and that's a great point, um, Professor, because that's what they have, that's the operating principle these places have already, re, always uh, operated under. It, but it, I'm here to tell you, and I'm here going over this case, uh, to show you that it's not the law. And I'm going back to that first class when everybody, when someone asked me about a loophole, this is the loophole. These are the loopholes. Um, this is how you fight back. This is how you own, how you go back uh, and, and retain the rights to your, uh, to your invention. Um, what, did, uh, what was Professor Eager's main mes message at the last uh, lecture? Question everything. That not only uh, has to do with, um, with uh, the MIT news and claims made by inventors, 
but it has to do with claims by people who say they have the rights to your invention, okay? And, and that's, I think, something that questioning everything is, a, is, is a, a, I guess, the guiding principle or the operating premise that you all should be following in this course. All right. I have a quick question, if that's okay. Please do, yes. Yeah, so I used to work for General Electric, and um, they tried to use logic that was like, we built your expertise in this area. Therefore, if you create anything in this area, it is part of our ownership because they had paid for trainings, et cetera. So that is that has no basis in the law. Yeah, well, you know, there's there's lots of tall buildings uh, out there in downtown Boston full of uh, people in interior offices wearing little gray 38 uh, shiny suits that come up with these, these ideas. And remember, they're advocates for a, uh, for a client, and they may very well assert things like that. that. But that assertion, in my opinion, is very similar to the assertion that the uh, board of uh, trustees of uh, Leyland Stanford College made uh, and which um, uh, the Supreme Court um, uh, uh, put a full stop to. Um, in my opinion, um, and even though I'm not allowed to dispense legal advice here, but if, if I were to uh, dispense legal advice, it would be to say uh, that that's nonsense, um, uh, to use a technical legal term, okay? Um, so- um, I had another question. Yes, please. Does the word conceived suggest that an idea um, could also be protected? Well, so um, uh, that the devil is in the details. The answer to that question is it depends. The, the, the lower courts, including the Federal Circuit uh, Court of Appeals, which is that courthouse I was talking to you across from the White House that Congress created just for uh, handling intellectual property matters, um, has a whole series of cases that talk about um, uh, the word conceived, uh, because this, uh, this has come up before. And um, the answer to your question without getting into the specifics is it depends. But ordinarily what that means is it must be expressed in some tangible form, okay? Um, that's the general rule. Um, now the most, the broadest possible interpretation of that uh, rule would be the, the, the general electric posi uh, position that uh, we just heard about. Um, but I think that if that were tested in the Supreme Court based upon the precedent laid down so far by the federal circuit in all the cases I'm familiar with and, and, and have read, I think that that would be um, a non-starter, okay? Because conceived is such a, a, um, uh, a nebulous term. Um, and the courts have struggled with its um, interpretation. And they've tried to sort of like uh, make it, uh, give it some uh, uh, objective meaning. Um, and so the answer is it depends. But you know, you, what you have is on, on, on one end of the spectrum, you have it reduced to uh, writing of some form or uh, saved on a computer hard drive, you know, that's, that's conceived uh, within, I think, the Baudol Act. And then on the far end of the, um, the other end of the uh, spectrum, you have the general uh, electric point of view, which, I, uh, which I, uh, I'd be happy to take that one on. Today. So um, that's the answer to that. Any other questions? Okay, so um, what happened after uh, Leyland Stanford Junior College. You know, what, what was the reaction to Leyland? And this, of course, affects each and every one of you. Well, the first thing that happened is the Federal Circuit seizing on that, okay, um, absent an agreement between the parties to the contrary language. The Federal Circuit has actually established a, a whole line of cases interpreting employment agreements uh, that allows contracting parties like you and GE, you and Raytheon, you and Intel, you and whomever, um, uh, to choose language that 
optionally includes either a promise to cooperate and assign rights or else an, or else an automatic assignment that occurs constructively at the moment of invention. Now, GE may have had you sign an agreement which says this. And the, the one place where I think GE would have a point is if uh, that person in the interior office in the little gray suit came up with language that basically says that if you have an idea working while working for us, um, it's ours. Now, if you signed a contract that says that, that may be enforceable, um, but not, but absent a contract that, that has language as outrageous as that, um, I would say that, it, that GE doesn't have a leg to stand on. That doesn't mean that, um, uh, that they perhaps have, have tried. I've never seen that kind of language. Um, and, and that language also can run into trouble with the courts uh, as being against public policy and things like that. Um, but that's the only place I think that you could find any support for GE's um, argument. And that is if they had some uh, one, one of their law firms develop uh, a, a, an agreement that was put under your nose, which you signed um, uh, unbeknownst to uh, you uh, containing this language, you know, you might, you might have a problem. Um, and, and it's illustrated, um, you know, by, by the example I'm setting here. And that is thinking back to the case, if Stanford had chosen the very more stringent automatic assignment language for its employment contract, then it would have automatically taken the rights to that. And they could have set aside the rights that were granted to Roche. But remember, it, not, it, it just doesn't have to be automatic. There has to be language in the contract about what it is that is being automatically assigned. So it has to describe what is being assigned in some way. Um, so there has to be usually some expression in tangible form. Otherwise, how do you enforce the contract? What is being um, assigned? If the, if, if, the, if the object that is being assigned is impossible to define, then there's no assignment. So there has to be some kind of expression in, in tangible form, all right? So um, that brings us to the, the last question, which is you know, whether universities have the bargaining power or the influence to require employees to sign these in stringent contracts. And the answer is, if you need a job, um, you know, um, they probably do. Uh, as anyone, I guess, who works for GE, which I didn't know about this, uh, probably uh, has learned or is learning right now. The key is though, when you, when you have something like this stuck under your nose, don't just sign it automatically. You, you do have bargaining power in these situations. Bring it to an attorney, have your attorney um, take a look at it. Usually what they stick under your nose is, you, is usually just a first pass. They wanna see if you'll sign it. If you won't sign it, they usually will bargain in good faith um, and um, amend the contract uh, usually what we do is we, we, we work out a, an arrangement where you get to share uh, in, um, uh, in, in the results of your inventions. So um, uh, don't just sign it, question everything. And when you do find something that you're questioning, um, seek uh, appropriate advice uh, because you probably don't have to sign uh, the first draft of what's stuck under your nose. Um, so uh, getting back to our original question about uh, the uh, conductive polymers, who owns the rights? Well, uh, in order of, uh, in reverse order of, um, of uh, priority, the inventor, the assignees, the Naval Research uh, Laboratory, Intel and Raytheon. And as you can see, this comes straight out of the, the Ba-Dole Act. It's most likely that the Ba-Dole Act applied to that uh, conducting polymers invention because of the way it was, um, it was um, uh, funded by the Office of Naval Research. Uh, and if it didn't uh, come under that exception, it probably uh, uh, comes under the exception where the parties um, uh, entered into some sort of an agreement. I assume that the inventor of that machine uh, had an agreement in place somewhere. So one of the two options, the exceptions, was probably in place at the time. 
but it's important for you to remember that absent an agreement or an invention, the priority is inventor, assignee, funder, contractor. But when the exceptions get, um, uh, uh, get implicated, the order gets reversed. Not because the constitution says so, but because either Congress or the parties have voluntarily uh, given, a, given up this order of priority. But if, um, uh, but if you're a student uh, working in research, you need to be aware of this order of priority and how it can be reversed on you. Steve, All can right. I just give you an example from that famous technical university on the Charles? <laughs> the, the, um, the one that will remain unnamed, right? Right. <laughs> um, they, they slipped up once in the 1980s in policies and procedures. And they said, um, they may have said something like, usually undergraduates have the rights to anything they invent. And graduate students usually have assigned that to the university. Well, the reason for that, they never explained that. But I always thought, well, what's the difference between an undergraduate and a graduate student? Well, one day I figured it out. Undergraduates pay tuition. They are not employees of the university. So if they invent something, they're the inventor. Right. There's no one standing in line ahead of them. In fact, there's no one standing in line ahead of them anyway, as you've said. But a graduate student, for the sake of tuition and a stipend, they are considered employees. And I think you probably had to sign something when you got your, anyway, uh, when you received your stipend. So about 10 years ago, for years, I had been trying to convince companies that it's okay to, to, to uh, have an inner agreement with uh, this famous school um, and that they could work things out on intellectual property. And they never could, okay? And finally, I realized about 10 years ago, I advised the company, I said, look, if you pay the student yourself and pay their tuition, they'd be just like an undergraduate and they would have the rights. And so they went and it took, turns out the corporate agreement from their lawyers to MIT took one week to agree. MIT, when faced with the facts, they will capitulate. You know, let me say something good about MIT, since we're naming names at this point. I want to say something good about their office, uh, uh, their, their um, office of technology or whatever it's called, the intellectual property office. Um, oftentimes, although I find it usually is when a student is represented, um, the uh, office of technology services um, will cooperate with um, uh, students and um, have in, at times, shared the royalties gener generously with students. Um, it's a fact that sometimes they have to be reminded uh, of their purpose, which is the dissemination of knowledge and not uh, the accumulation of uh, royalties. But, but um, don't be afraid of the uh, Office of Technology Services. Um, you know, um, uh, don't be afraid to, to bring matters to their attention. Don't be afraid to negotiate with them. Don't be afraid to uh, retain an attorney to represent you in a matter that is commercially uh, worthwhile um, because they, they, uh, they have been known to do the right thing uh, on, um, uh, on occasion. And it's not a place to be afraid of. It's a place to, um, uh, that you can, I think, uh, uh, deal forthrightly and honestly with. That doesn't mean giving up your rights, but you don't have to be afraid of dealing it with anyone when you deal forthrightly and honestly, okay? I would, I would agree with that. MIT gives the inventor one third of the royalties after you take out the expenses, which is extremely generous. I've never heard of any company that would did that. So, but you have to remember when you're talking to them, they have a conflict of interest. They're not there to advise you. That's right. Okay, they're, they're, they're there to work with you and they will, and they will do it honestly, but someone has to remind them of the correct principles. Yep, it's usually when you bring a guy in a, or a woman in a gray suit carrying a leather briefcase with you, that's uh, when everybody uh, deals forthrightly and honestly. 
So, uh, uh, you know, there are exceptions to, to um, the general rule, but by and large, the Office of uh, Technology Services uh, deals uh, forthrightly uh, and honestly with students at MIT, and they're, they're nothing to be afraid of. They're just be upfront with them uh, and be honest, um, and don't give anything away that you don't have to. Remember, the example that Professor Eager just gave um, is a reflection of this order of priority. Inventor first, assignees of the inventor second, the funder uh, and the contractors. That's the order of priority, unless one of those two exceptions that I've described kicks in. One, that you voluntarily uh, uh, give away those rights, or number two, where Congress has stepped in and, and carved out a, a very narrow exception like the Bar Dole Act. Any other questions? Okay, I promised to get to paper bags last week. I, I wanna do just a quick run through of uh, paper bags because we talked about uh, this famous paper bag, or at least to me, it's a famous ba paper bag and hopefully it'll be a famous paper bag to you. Did anybody um, uh, bother to sit down and give a think about how many examples of intellectual property are represented by, um, well, by uh, this um, ubiquitous, humble, uh, uh, paper bag. Anybody come up with any examples? Well, I'll tell you a little bit about this paper bag in the time that we have. This particular patent, uh, uh, paper bag patented by Apple uh, had a team of 20 designers, including um, Sir Johnny Ive. Do you know, anybody know who Sir Johnny Ive is? Sir, uh, the, the designers in this class will know who Sir Johnny Ive is. He was Apple's chief designer for I don't know how many years. Uh, he's a famous uh, British uh, design architect. Um, I think they made him, uh, as the title implies, uh, a knight or whatever. He's accumulated, besides uh, about a billion dollars net worth uh, for his, um, uh, his intellectual property rights, uh, but he's also uh, accumulated many honors among them. Uh, from the, uh, from the royal family, but he's a big name in design and uh, a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant designer. So he's one of the 20 invest, uh, inventors that are listed on, uh, on the actual application for this thing. Um, so here are some of the examples of the uh, intellectual property in the paper bag. Um, the Apple logo, of course, is a design patent and also a trademark. The material composition um, of the uh, of the bag, which uh, uh, trans translates into a utility patent. In this particular case, uh, it has to be um, it has to be composed of 60% recyclable materials, and and they and they came upon that number through a researching into how bags react um, when composed of different materials uh, when they get wet. Uh, there's this. Whole, there's this whole slew of research uh, into paper bags that they did. Uh, the design of the handle so it doesn't hurt your fingers when you're carrying your $10,000 Apple paper, uh, Apple computer home. The design of the tabs and the reinforcing inserts that have to do with the performance of the bag and actually the machine process for fa uh, fabricating the bag. Those are all examples of um, the technology that has been patented in this um, uh, in this um, this particular bag, and um, you know, I have examples here of the um, you know of the actual patent and uh, what it's composed of, and I can get back to that later. Um, uh, you know, when we can talk about why patent it, why we should patent, or why anyone would patent a uh, paper bag. Um, but what I wanted to do is leave you with this last thought, this last tease. Um, we'll start with why someone uh, would want to patent a, a paper bag, which will lead us uh, to the improbable uh, story of Margaret Knight, who is the inventor of the uh, unassuming ubiquitous modern paper bag, a really, really fascinating self-made engineer from New Hampshire uh, who worked in the cotton mills uh, in the turn of the century really a woman uh, of um, amazing ability and accomplishment. And I want to talk about her inventions and her career because she really uh, has touched each and every one of our lives, including your lives here today. And so next class, we'll talk about her and uh, how she uh, relates to your life. Any questions? I know you've got places to go and people to meet. Thanks for coming today. Um, see you next Wednesday.
if you have any questions, uh, as Jane knows, you can email me. I'm happy to talk about anything that comes up in class. Um, don't be uh, don't be strangers. Okay, everybody. All right. Hey, okay. Stephen. Yes, sir. Um, I just tossed in the chat the agreement that General Electric had me sign. I'm, I'm not sure if that's allowed or not, but I'm um, just like says if you wanted to check it out and see and is it, on the, like, is it on the chat i can oh i see there's like uh all right let me take a quick look oh i see it it's a it's a pdf i will yep. look at it at work today uh i'm fascinated by it um it's, it's mainly the first couple bullet he, points he can't give legal advice yeah i just uh just like a for reference of what people right, might right. see out in the industry um, you, might like, want to P, you might want to send the PDF. I'm not sure if the chat survives this. Uh, I was going to say, I'm, 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 I'm looking. Uh, I just, you know what? I just downloaded it. There's a little button underneath that says, uh, has an okay. arrow. So if you're so on. you got it. Okay. Yeah, just, just press that. But I will look at it uh, for what it was intended to educate me. And I will tell you what I learned. Uh, I'm not going to be giving you legal advice, but I will tell you what I was able to learn from your agreement. Thank you for the learning opportunity. Any other, Thank any you. Any other questions? Okay, thanks. Okay, guys. Cheers.